So uh, today's theme is urban development, sustainable urban development, of course. And um, it will be a little more complicated than we have had before. It's interesting that tomorrow there will be conference in UCOS on this theme also. So it fits very well with that. Um, urbanization, of course, is the background to this. <clears throat> Today, a majority of the population on the planet live in urban areas. <laughs> However, it's not always a good living one out of three live in slums, very bad urban areas. Um, but still we see um, that urbanization continues with um, people getting richer. So when people have more money, they move to urban settlements. In Sweden, which is a fairly rich country globally, 85% already live in cities and towns. And the interesting, uh, you know, other side of this movement is that land, large land areas become almost empty. We'll come back to that. This is the development. Uh, you see the urban population and rural population, both are increasing because we have a population increase on our planet but urban population is increasing much faster. So uh, you see that in about 2007 or so, there that was the point when urban population was larger than people living on the countryside. And this trend is still continuing, although it's very different in different parts of the world. Here you see, um, the, the different uh, continents and so on. And the most remarkable is the Chinese development. It, this is the dotted line, the dark dotted line. You see it starts <clears throat> with 10% about 1950 and is today it's up to 75%, 80%. The building of cities in China has been enormous, enormous the last years, still is in fact, um, although not quite as much. And in general, you see Asia is having a uh, high level on this curve. North America and Europe is a little slower. And it goes up to 2050, as you say, uh, it's predicted, of course, the development up to 2050. Uh, however, we need to also remember that the movement into cities from countryside has passed its maximum. So it's slower today. You see the annual urban growth rates here is decreasing everywhere. And of course, the most dramatic decrease is in China again. It's the dotted line, the blue dotted line. So now it's almost stopped this development. Um, the world as a whole, you can see it goes um, the large and the, the solid line, uh, the, the most um, remarkable line here with it. Um, yes, this, this is just one example of the development in China is Guangzhou. It's a city in the so-called Pearl River Delta of China, where there is some 12.7 million people. And this is only one out of nine cities, which are very close to each other. So they can be counted as a single agglomeration. And this have 57 million inhabitants in 2013. It's probably a little larger today. Um, put together. So it's enormous. It's like a country, you can say. It's like a not so small country, twice as big as, for example, Uzbekistan, and six times as big as Sweden. It's the size of France, for example, uh, population wise. It's the largest urban area in the world. You know, the next 
largest urban area in the world, as far as I know, is the Tokyo region in Japan, with uh, something between 20 and 40 million people, depending on how you count. So there are enormous urban areas. And here you can see also a little the kind of buildings so or the kind of housing that's being constructed in China in rapid pace all over the country. Uh, there are sky, uh, skyscrapers, so to speak, high, high um, buildings with the 10th or 20 or 30 levels. Uh, this is the other type of urbanization we see too much of. Now we are in Africa. It's a slum area outside Nairobi. And you see people are living extremely close. It's often in unplanned areas. This means that, you know, the uh, management of um, toilet waste, sanitation, water supply and energy supply and so on is very small. It's unplanned area. So it's... Uh, not good life here, but people come from countryside anyhow because they can't support themselves out in the countryside. Uh, this is a close up. You see, it's really shabby houses or shelters they live in. About a third of the urbanization in the world today is of this kind. Here is an, in Rio de Janeiro, so South America. This is still very bad areas. Lot of crime, lot of poverty, uh, lot of bad health, and so on. So some of the urbanization is really bad. Here you see some different types. Of course, this rapid urbanization have given rise to very repetitive, repetitive type of living conditions. Either you have uh, these enormous high-rise buildings, or you have a complete um, uh, overwhelming amount of small houses or um, um, as you see up to the right, another type. So that's what we see very much of today. This is the other side of the whole thing, the countryside that is being depopulated. This is somewhere in Northern Portugal. So these large areas which does not have very many people any longer, they have the possibility to expand their wildlife. So there is a big project that's still going on very much called Rewilding Europe. So rewilding simply means that people are trying to reintroduce animals in particular that was extinct for many, many, many years. For example, wild horses is one of the more interesting things that's going on, uh, introduction of various um, um, animals like wolf and lynx and so on is going on, uh, introduction of, uh, you know, the European bison, the Vicente and so on. Now next, next area for rewilding seems to be Northern Sweden, in fact. So this, this is another aspect of it, and it's meant to be possible to keep this going and having a small income by having them as a um, uh, ecotourism areas, like uh, the savannas in Africa and so on, one could have a similar experience in Europe and other parts of the world, of course. Now, uh, so this is what's going on. Now, the next question is, what would be a sustainable human habitat? Could we come up with some very clear statement here? And the first is, of course, the background. The classical sustainable urban area is the so-called city on the hill. This is from southern France, but you see many such areas or towns in southern Europe not the least in Italy. So this sustainable city has been a model since antiquity, thousands of years, in fact. And of course, they rely on resources coming in from the surrounding uh, countryside, like, you know, vegetables and so on. And uh, they live fairly close to each other. There is not much need or even space for cars and so on. There is everything that's 
the population would like to see, like a church, etc., within little town. So that's a very classical model. Today it's of course different. Here are two pictures from Sweden. Uh, you see to the left, you see um, uh, the so-called Royal Seaport area. I think um, Björn Frostell has talked to you about that because he made quite much research on that new area. Uh, and of course there has been a lot of efforts to make it less dependent on transport, to have very good energy provision, to have very good waste management and so on. To the right you see in other parts, uh, it's an area on the west part of Sweden, where you see something that I would say is a little more human scale, because the houses are not very high, there's a lot of greenery, there are areas for the kids to play and so on. So some possibilities. What is discussed very much in connection with building new urban areas is densification. How dense should they be? So this is one aspect here that's important to keep track of. Uh, the, the modern but still established urban areas are quite dense. For example, New York we see here um, and Copenhagen. Those areas, it's not possible, so it's not so easy to have your own car. So um, in New York, 70% of the tra transport or mobility is public transport. In Copenhagen, we have talked about it before, about 40% of transport is by bike. So it's very well established bike possibility. It's not in New York, of course. Um, yes. Uh, in other areas, this is in Ukraine, it's not so well managed. For example, waste management is really a bad um, situation and it's not good anywhere really. Even in Uppsala where I live, waste management is not at all perfect. It's a lot to be improved here. So this is another aspect of urban areas that need to be looked at. So which are the difficulties or challenges that we face when developing an urban area? First of all, uh, urbanization, if the urban growth is big, then there is a planning um, challenge. That is, you have to add water provision, energy provision, waste management, etc., etc. That has to come together with the planning of the city. And also demand for land. Quite often the demand is on uh, land used for cultivation of crops, it's not so good. We need our land that can be used for produ producing food. So it really should be in other types of land when we uh, expand our cities. And of course also there is demand for natural resources and energy. For example, water provision is going to be a crisis on very many places and uh, that needs to be taken care of. Pollution, especially pollution from vehicles, that is cars running on uh, you know, gasoline and diesel and so on, is uh, a concern. Mobility, that is how should you move around how to organize your public transport, how to organize your streets and roads and so on. And health, of course, is very important to have um, um, water properly managed so it does not carry waterborne diseases. To be sure that uh, ventilation in houses and everywhere is proper so we don't suffer from bad health because of that. And now we are facing pandemics, as you know, then there is a need for people not to be too close to each other. So that has also to be taken care of. Yes, we should continue now and look at the opportunities for cities. What is good with them? What could really be used to improve sustainability? Well, first of all, 
cities is the classical place for economic growth and uh, you know inventions, knowledge, uh, education, of course, both school education and higher education is also the classical place for cult culture, that is, you know, everything from theater, music, whatever you have, and integration, that is, different type of cultures are meeting. There is much possibilities for efficiency improvement because of um, people are living closer to each other. There is not so much need for energy for mobility. There is much more efficient use of the land and so on. And of course, these things can come together. So there are system solutions that are possible in urban areas. So these are the opportunities. So we, we can summarize what challenges are we, are we facing to deal with when developing city areas sustainably. Energy, transition to energy without fossils, we need to have renewable energy. Um, materials, we have to recycle all materials and this means we have to have a very efficient system for waste management or waste, if you wish, you could have, you can look at the three R, reuse, reduce, reuse, and recycle. And economy, of course, transition to a post-industrial economy is going on in very many cities. That is more to a service economy than to a uh, producing economy. And then demography, in very many cities, we have an aging population how to deal with a population where more than half of them do not work anymore, but has to be supported by those who do work. So these are some very clear challenges. Uh, this picture shows the, um, uh, how energy use and density or densification are connected. You see it's urban density and transport related energy consumption. Um, the worst cases is in the US, especially in Southern US. You see Houston is on the top of this curve where this gigajoule per capita per year is enormous. And of course, it's also a very spread city. They live in individual houses at big distances from each other. And then it goes on like that, we used on Phoenix, Detroit, Denver, Los Angeles, and so on. When it comes down to Boston, Washington, Chicago, there is much less uh, spread out cities. And New York, of course, um, also going down. And then if you come down to the <clears throat> blue part of the, this scheme, you are in Europe. You see in Hamburg, Stockholm, Frankfurt, Brussels, and so on, as indicated, it's seven, eight times less energy per capita per year for transport compared to the worst cases in the United States. So this kind of cities we have in Europe allows for much more efficient transport solutions. And then if you go to places like Hong Kong, on the right hand side, which is extremely dense. Then of course the um, uh, energy use for transport is very much smaller, really smaller. And you see on the lower end, the so-called X scale, you see the number of inhabitants per hectare uh, as the measure of the density, urban density, going from zero to 300. The 300, of course, is very, very many people on each hectare. So you see densification is a main issue to deal with when it comes to urban development. Of course, the buildings themselves is another very important part of it. So you see on the top picture here, the old classical structure has about uh, 300 um, it's a uh, kilo of carbon dioxide equivalent per 100 square meters per year. It's how the 
energy use is being measured here. Uh, so these are classical old houses in cities in Europe, built before 1980 or so. A more modern is down to 90 or a third or even less, in fact. Uh, it could go down to even 50. And these are the so-called low energy houses. Or from 2021, the new European Union directive when it comes to uh, low energy houses is um, forcing new houses to have a very good energy standard. And then of course the most extreme is a called passive house, German passive house, meaning we have very little energy from outside. Most of the energy is actually provided from the people living there and the equipment you have in the house. So you see there on the lower side, you see more or less the same thing, but developed into different kind of energy resources. Uh, this building of a passive house, I think you have seen before. It's one that is just north of Stockholm. I've been in it. That was very pleasant to be there. And they're relying on extremely efficient insulation, extremely efficient energy exchange, the incoming and outgoing air, and a small heat pump, a ground heat pump. So it's working extremely well. It's not much more expensive, it's a little more expensive. Uh, but that money is being, is coming back very soon um, because of the less energy costs for the house. Uh, this also now is about transport in the city. It can be done by rail, efficient. This is now a tram in Marseille. You have seen that picture before as well, I think. And of course, the, this um, allows for a very efficient personal transport. Uh, also, you have seen this one. It allows for biking in the city. And it's also a good solution for efficient um, transport solutions. Of course, with a bike, you can travel several kilometers before it is too much for most people. Um, again, how dense could uh, build, built environment be? And this is one example of an environment that is not too dense, I think. So this is possible, but greenery is very important. So this is an example of greenery. I believe this is in uh, <clears throat> Italy. And you see it's possible on classical modern buildings that have much more greenery than what has been the case in almost everywhere. So they are cultivating their own vegetables quite much on the balconies or even on the walls, in fact. And so you, you can harvest quite much of what you need to eat in this way. And of course, greenery is very good for the health of people. There are many studies on this. For example, uh, patients in the hospital get, uh, you know, healthy much quicker if they have a tree outside the window in the room where they live, where, where they are. So this is, has been studied quite much and it's, very important in fact people can also be seen to be um, getting healthier if they are have the opportunity to walk in a park or a forest every day so greener is important this is a typical park environment that needs to be a um, part of every city so green spaces play an important role in sustainable development we need to remember that Yes, so these are some areas that we can think of when uh, designing cities and new parts of cities. It, so a sustainable city has to be fairly dense. So the advantages of living closer to each other can be used properly. Efficient distribution of energy, water, transport and so on. It has to be fairly green. So every inhabitant in the city have access to green, they can see it, they 
uh, the trees and the gardens and the, whatever bushes and so on. Uh, on the buildings and between the buildings, of course. It, it has to be good transport infrastructure. It has to have good materials recycling. And of course, it has to be well managed. And you can make a long, long list here. I just started this list. In fact, now <clears throat> when we have a break, you can continue this list. Discuss during the break which problems you have in your living area. Discuss which resources you have in your living area where you live. And discuss uh, ways to improve your living area to be more sustainable. So this is what I hope you can discuss a little during your break. And then we will see each other again in 20 minutes as we used to. So <clears throat> the second half here will deal with urban management, how to work with projects in a city. And uh, now this will be more complicated than when we have talked about management before. Because city as a system, with very many aspects, and they have to be treated together. So the, it's a multi-dimensional issue to deal with the city development. This is just one example taken from one book on city development. So you see the four the four issues here: housing, transportation, infrastructure, and services are all uh, influencing each other. So for example, infrastructure, for example, streets and transportation, they can lead to congestion. Uh, housing and transportation, of course, it has to do with car use or vehicle use, depending on how housing is developed. Um, and services, of course, it has to do where is uh, where, where do you have to go, for example, the shops or the, uh, where, where to buy things and so on. So here is just examples of how things are connected. You have to deal with everything together. Now, you can see this in different ways. We have uh, preferred to look at resource, resources. So first of all, you have the material resources. It's all the material flows in the city. You know, you have, um, you have energy, you have water, you have uh, waste, etc., etc. And urban planning resources. These are the surface area where you have buildings or streets and so on. Human resources, you have all the people living there. You have societal resources, all the functions in the city, everything from the city council to, uh, you know, um, say museums or um, schools and so on. Um, and you have the economic resources. These are the companies and everyone else who is having money. So you see these five resources are all measured in different ways. Some material resources are in kilograms. Urban planning resources are in square meters or hectares or whatever. Human resources, they are the people, individuals. Uh, societal resources are these functions. And economic resources are in money, dollars or whatever you have. These resources are not interchangeable. They cannot replace for each other and they are all limited. So they have to be care, taken care of separately, but um, connected. So sustainable development in cities are best understood as the careful management of limited resources. And we have these five resources. So just one example now, how to work with the material resources, the first kind of resources. You have energy, water, and wastes I mentioned here, but of course you can go further um, above this. 
And this is the city metabolism, if you wish. The integrated material flows, energy, water, waste is the metabolism of the city. So energy, water, and solid materials enter the metabolism, waste leaves. Energy is carried by solid resources, such as biogas or whatever. The whole thing is a system. The material flows constitute a system. And if we now talk about the efficient management of limited resources, it's the same thing here. We have to be energy efficient, not use more energy than what we have. We have to save water, recirculate perhaps. And we have to take care of the waste properly, you know, that is uh, recycled materials and so on. So this is one example. Uh, it, we could do the same thing with the other types of resources, which I will not do now. It with the material resources is an example of how it can be done. Now, when we talk about integrated management, it's very important when we want to achieve sustainable development. And it's always a process or so the procedure. There is a way from step to step how to manage with this. So the first is the system's description. You should be able to describe the city and all its resources. You should have a vision how you want it to develop, what you want it to be in the future. You need to monitor what you are doing with the use of indicators. Some measures, you know, that are being measured uh, every year or whatever, all the time. And you have a system for management. There are several such systems. And then you have, have to carry out projects. So uh, let's look a little at this. First, visioning. This is just a drawing of uh, my city. We wanted it to develop a new train system, a new train station. And this is what we thought it would be like. So what is good here? How could we access the train system? Which are the size of the platforms, etc. everything there. This is a little more uh, developed version of the vision. What would you like your city to look like in 50, 50 or so years into the future? And of course, such uh, visions are often being made in seminars when people are able or are invited to come up with their points of view and then everything is collected into a vision. And this is something that Göteborg did many years ago and they talked about Göteborg 2050. So it was 50 years uh, into the future. And they sorted out five main areas that was important to develop. First, energy, so they want to develop the sun city. Secondly, urban structure, especially they pointed to green areas. We want green areas. Third, transport. And you know, transport, we talked about it. And then food, uh, healthy food, ecological food, you know, all that. And recycling that is waste management in the proper way. So those five aspects of the city in 50 years time they want to develop. So that was their vision, what to do. And then of course, indicators, very important here. So these red spots is something that you have measured and you have measurement every or so year. Uh, Often you have a target, you see on the right hand side, there's this target. This is what you want to achieve in the long term. Uh, from the target, you can often do back casting, that is going back in times, coming close to present. And then on the um, distance between the present and the target in the future, you can put milestones. That's what you want to achieve certain years to be able to arrive to the target. 
And sometimes you have benchmarks. And benchmarks is something that you find often in other cities. This is, looks good, so you could use that. So this is very important to have indicator and see how the indicator develops over time. How to choose indicator is very, very important because it's a lot of work to, you know, to measure, report and so on these indicators. So it's uh, it's serious thing to cho choose indicators. And also it's a big thing. Most cities have 50 or so indicators, in fact. Uh, some examples in medicine, what do you choose for an indicator? Well, very often it's body temperature. That is, you can see if people have fever or something more serious. You don't use body height as an indicator because it doesn't tell you so much about the health of the person. And so on. You, you can measure red blood cells, for example, in your blood. This is important for, this says something about your health. The color of the skin doesn't say so much. So it's important to choose good indicators. In resource management, just one example here. If you have an ecological footprint, uh, there is a value for this footprint when it is uh, on the right track. It's 1.8 hectares per capita, so-called global hectares per capita. And values for cities can be worked out. So this is one way to look at it. Another is the Human Development Index developed by the United Nations. The Human Development Index, according to the, you know, the, the uh, statistics from the United Nations, should be something like 0 0.8 to um, be sustainable. So this is a benchmark or a value that relates to sustainability. These indices are composite indices. They consist of several components. The footprint, for example, often have six components. You know, there is the built area, the forest area, the water area, and so on. And Human Development Index has three components. It's the economic, it is the um, poverty, that is, it's education, and so on. They're, so there they are developed to reflect a composite situation. Uh, one need to be aware that not all indicators have a sustainability value. They could still be useful, but if they do not have a proper value reflecting sustainability, they, we call them descriptors, not indicators. So you need to see the difference between these two kinds of measures. Descriptor, for example, it says that how many of the students in the schools get environmental education? Well, that's of course interesting to know, but it doesn't tell you so much about if it's sustainable or not. Our indicators, as I mentioned, you select a few carefully select a few and then you should decide on if there is a target sustainability targets i mentioned the human development index which has a target 0 0.8 or the ecological footprint which has a target 1.8 global hectares and then you should look at the gap that is what is the gap from the value now and this target if you have, for example, human development index is 0.5 instead of 0.8, then the gap is 0 0.3, etc. And then you should talk about how could you uh, limit that gap? How can you reduce it? What can you do to improve your um, human development index so it comes closer to 0 0.8? This is how you use indicators. 
Uh, we did a rather large project called sustainment with 14 cities in this part of Europe some years back, together with the Obo in Finland. And we found out that cities report on indicators. Often they report on 50 to 60 indicators. So this is a big undertaking in cities to take care, to develop indicators and measure them and report. It's a big thing. Uh, indicators were often based on political decisions. For example, targets were politically decided. For example, say waste management, then the city council decided that you should reduce waste by 40%. So this is a political decision, but it doesn't say so much about sustainability. So one really should have a sustain sustainability value as well. These um, indicators were used in projects to, to follow up how the projects were, you know, process, proceeding. Uh, the collection of values for the indicators are often quite uh, complicated. It's a big job and cities often co cooperated with universities to monitor indicators and collecting the data. It's a good job for students, by the way. And these cities, not every one of them, but many, provided indicator values over time. So uh, you can see how things proceed, if they're getting better or not so good. And some of these cities did not quite understand why they needed sustainability targets. It, I, I had to spend much discussion with city representatives why this is important. Uh, well, it's very important if we want to know what is sustainable. For example, a doctor knows that a healthy person has a body temperature of 37 centigrades. So he has to know that to be able to say if the person is healthy or not. It's the same thing with the city. We have to know what is the value of the indicator when it is sustainable, to know if we are sustainable or not. It's very basic. So the, if you wish, you can say that a sustainable city is a healthy city. So the comparison with the patient and the doctor and so on is not so bad, in fact. You want to live in a healthy city for yourself and for the planet. It's fairly easy, sometimes at least, to have an indicator, you know, target value when it comes to environment. Uh, for example, when it comes to uh, pollution, we can give, give a value. We can't have more and so and so not nitrogen oxides in the air to uh, not to pollute our, ourselves and our children and so on. Uh, we, we can't, you know, emit more and more, um, more than so and so carbon dioxide. We can't have more and more uh, than so much of some pollutants like mercury and so on. So it's fairly direct to come up with a target value when it comes to environment. It's more difficult when it comes to social indicators. What kind of poverty could we accept? Uh, what kind of um, living area is acceptable? and such things. So often we don't come up with a target in this absolute sense that we have with environment, but more like benchmarking. Benchmarking means that we compare ourselves with others and say that this benchmark is what we want to achieve. You actually make a, you know, a with a pen or a knife, you make a marking on the bench and say, this is where we want to go. And this discussion about where we want to know what is a good benchmark or what is a good 
you know, target value for environmental indication. So on. it's a very, very good discussion to have. It's a qualified discussion. You learn much about the indicator and you learn much about the city situation in such discussions. So that's, that's another, uh, say, um, contribution from the work with indicators. These are some examples. These are indicators for environment. You have carbon dioxide emissions from building, from transport, from industry, air pollution, water, municipal waste. And you have five cities, London, New York, Stockholm, Rome, and Tokyo. And you see where they are in this. It's a spider diagram. It's called spider diagram here. And you see if they are good or not so good. Remember that in other areas, not sustainable development of cities, but in economy, indicators are reported every day. In the newspapers, several pages are used to report indicators. That is, you know, uh, what is uh, the cost of one dollar in your currency? What is the um, um, share value of things? What is the value of companies, etc., 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 every day? So, in the field of economics, indicators are, you know, obvious, used all the time. We need to do the same thing when it comes to city development and environment and so on. Management systems. This is a management system that's taken from a project called Managing Urban Europe. And you see it consists of four parts. This, you start by planning. You see on the right hand side on the circle, you start by planning. Then you, then you, you, you do something, then you check if you did was okay, and then you conclude and act. And on the left side, you see a little more in detail, baseline review, target setting, political commitment. This is important. This is important that, you know, the whole city management agrees. So this is what we should do. And that the, Decisions in the city council supports the development. And then you have implementation and then you come to uh, evaluation and then you are back. It's often three years for such a cycle, often three years, but it's different for different projects, of course. So here you have it, baseline review, target setting, political commitment, implementation, monitoring, you know, the indicators again, and evaluation. Often three years, as I mentioned. This is a little more developed uh, version of the um, management system. So I'll go through these nine points that come from the ISIS method of Alan Atkinson, good friend here, specialist in sustainable development. So he said, start by understanding the system. Uh, understand what is sustainability. It's very important that you understand what is sustainability. And then you have to distinguish between development and growth. Development is one thing, often quality, and growth is another thing, often quantity. So you need to see the difference here. It's not always that growth is a good thing. It could really be problematic. And then you need adequate information on what's going on in the system. And that then we come to indicators. Next is to understand the dynamics of the system, this, this city often, but it could also be company in fact, or a school or something. We should understand the dynamics. It is called systems analysis. 
And then you need to identify best practice. That is what is a good innovation in your system. Then next again, you have to understand how to make a change in that system, the strategy, how to, how to get something to happen. And then of course you need to implement it. Agree with everyone should agree that this is the change we are doing now. And then you want to uh, evaluate what's ha what happened. This is again indicator. So this is a more developed method which you can look for and learn more about. When it comes to the project, actually what can be done? It's the most common is to use one single new technology is introduced. Like for example, produ production of biogas or introduction of, introduction of uh, heat pumps or uh, some kind of street system. So um, one single new technology is the most common we see in cities. The second most common is a procedure social process. That is, it very much involves people, how they behave and so on. And less common, but the very best is a, to address a whole problematic set of problems and devise a portfolio of projects. So many projects come together to support each other and they're happening at the same time. And such a portfolio of projects often include some up to 30 projects in fact. Each of them are followed by an indicator and the, the problematic or the problem that we need to do is perhaps to develop a new part of the city and um, you know suburban part or a transport system or something like that and then you can go on you make a system matrix you have a lot of uh, entrances in this you have money you have time flame you have who is responsible and so on and it turns out that developed systems do have such matrices for example Stockholm has a very sophisticated matrices. I looked at that and they had 1200 entries. So this is a big thing. I'm just, you know, indicating that this is what one needs to have. Uh, this is report from a set of developments after, after such a management period of three years or even more. This is exactly after five years is development of Japan. And the result is a project that was run by, you know, a consortium of Japanese universities, some cities, and one ministry, I believe, from the government. And you see here what happened. You see, uh, it's four um, indicators that are used here, or set of indicators, nature, economy, social, situation and well-being. So you see that some of it improved quite much, for example, well-being, and others much, much less, for example, economy. And it goes uh, up to 2005 and it started in 1990. So it's, it's a long period that was measured here. We talk about frames when it comes to systems you know the frames and the classical frame is the triple bottom line it's used very much by companies they talk about ecology social and economy this is a triple bottom line reported by very many companies how did they do in terms of the ecological improvement social improvement and economic improvements of course but there are other ways to design a frame. So the compass, which we just looked at, is four dimensions. Especially they add this social dimension. Global Community Initiative is another one, it's an American system. They have five requirements as the frames. Habitat, which is the UN system for city development, they have seven resources as the frame. And Forum for Future is a British 
uh, system for urban development. They they report in five capitals. You know, you have the social capital, economic capital, environmental capital, and so on. So this is just uh, a picture of the compass with four uh, parts here: well-being to the left, to the west, west well-being, east economy, e economy, north nature. You know, this is environmental part, and south society. This is a social part. And in fact, I see this as much better than the triple bottom line. Here, some examples how it was done in various cities. This is in Uppsala. We just see that the uh, indicator were kilowatt hours per square meter in three different buildings. Uh, you see one uh, residential building, Bellman, was doing very well. Uh, the town hall of Uppsala did not do very well. So this is some examples how useful indicators are. Uh, this is the use of electricity. It's similar, in fact. Here it's measured, the indicator is uh, Swedish crowns per year. It's a residential building. Here is the EPC, European Performance Indicator. And here it's uh, terawatt hours of energy per year, that is the indicator. And uh, this is a huge European initiative that redesigns existing buildings to make them more energy efficient. You see, they were able to reduce energy use in the housing sector with about 22% and industry buildings with about 55%. So it has been quite successful. And here is the system. You have a, sorry, this is in Swedish. Uh, you have a pre-study, you have a project development phase, you have a action phase, and you have an assessment phase. So this is how it's being done. It takes several years. It includes the financing of it and so on. Uh, this is one case, this uh, residential area. Energy reduction was 36%. Seven houses, 11,000 square meters. The um, economic outcome here is that it took seven years to get the money back, and then they just earn money all the time. So there was an investment. This is not a much larger project. Uh, it included hospitals, clinics, schools, uh, residential areas, and so on. Much bigger project. The energy use uh, started with 250 kilowatt hours per square meter. This is typical classical value. They invested 65 millions. Time for repay after nine years, they started to earn money. Of course, energy improvements were very, very good. Uh, this is what we found out in the urban development projects I've been running in Baltic University. We saw much rescaling, upscaling, wastewater, for example, treatment plants took care of things instead of individual houses. This is upscaling, doing things together. Sometimes we saw downscaling, for example, instead of having, you know, um, um, getting heat from the city, the house installed the heat pump and took care of its own heat and so on. So that there are several ways to upscale, doing things together, downscale, doing things individually. That was a very common way to look at things, rescaling. Uh, we did not see so much integration as we wanted to do. But for example, there are some strategies, household waste to in, in, incineration, meaning that the waste was used to produce heat and electricity. Sludge from food waste was used for biogas for the buses. We have talked about it. Industrial energy, for example, steam energy go to district heating. So surplus energy from industry is used for the city. Agricultural waste, because there is much waste in agriculture, 
is used for incineration or biogas production, by the way. Waste water from the uh, wastewater treatment plant could be used for cultivation of mussels. This is, of course, on the coast. Wastewater could go to heat pumps also. Uh, human, just a few other resources, the material resources. Human resources, education is a very good project. Uh, good schools Im improve education in all kinds of schools. Professional competence development is very important because professions, skills develop all the time and people working in the various professions need to be aware of that. The schooling for immigrants is also very important. People coming to the country, they don't even speak the language and so on. They have to get some education. This is a very important part of human resources, economic resources, education again. Uh, offer places for starting companies. It's called incubators. And many cities have incubators. So those who want to get help to start a company, they can go there and get help. They can get an office, they can get a computer, they can get help in how to loan money to start investments and so on. So this is how to you know, deal with economic resources, social resources, the so-called third sector civil society is very important here. You can have NGOs for nature protection, you know, the people who like to be in nature can come together. Neighborhood cooperation is very good, very, very good. You can, you can take turns in the neighborhood to, you know, look at the, everything is working all right in the neighborhood. Uh, the cooperation between universities and cities, very, also very good, and so on. Um, yes, this is a neighborhood when the people have an environment where they easily get to know each other. This is just a summary of the strategies we found in the uh, Baltic University Urban Forum project. Reducing, replacing, rescaling, or recycling. That's what we saw quite often. Reducing, you know, use less energy, use less water. Replacing. Uh, you know, you have renewables instead of fossils, for example. Rescale, downscaling or upscaling, we already talked about. Or recycling, we also talked about. So this is what we saw quite often. A few examples of cities working together for this. The C40 cities, it's 40 cities, big cities around the world, leading from United States. Uh, to help each other to be more sustainable. Uh, ECO2 Cities Program is a World Bank project where many cities work together to become more sustainable. Everything here can be found on the internet. Uh, Habitat, UN Habitat is a United Nations cooperation between cities to become more sustainable. It's also possible to find on the internet, and of course, there have been some really big conferences in UN Habitat. And here are some more. ICLE, very important around the world, but especially in Europe. Sustainable Cities and Towns campaign, but maybe one of the oldest. It's from the 80s. Uh, and I, I will not mention everything here. It can be found on the internet. So this, the Sustainable Cities and Towns campaign I mentioned, it's really interesting and has been much cooperation, much practical projects done and much research. ICLE is good to keep track of because it can help a lot. They have yearly conferences. This year's conference has been on the internet because of the pandemic, but it's still going on. And this is the uh, Global Community Initiatives. It's uh, designed by Gwendolyn Hallsmith, an American researcher, uh, and it's in, uh, in the United States. Transition Towns is a British project, uh, which uh, is helping cities to uh, c combat climate change. And of course, 
we don't want it to look like this. It's not a smart city. Low interactivity, high cost. We want it to be more like this. This is a smart city. High interactivity between people, low cost. It doesn't cost very much to walk along this pavement and sit down and have a cup of coffee. So thank you very much. This is the end of it. Lecture two, you might remember that we have some reading courses. You have to look into this and you have it on the homepage.